Good morning. My name is Kate Tatton-Brown and I am a genetics doctor and a consultant in clinical genetics. And I'm also a professor in clinical genetics at St George's University um, of London and St George's University um, Hospitals NHS Foundation Trust. And they're both based in London in the UK. And this morning I want to talk to you about the journey from DNMT3A gene identification through to clinical delineation of TBRS. I'm going to begin the journey today by telling you a little bit about the childhood overgrowth study, which was first established in 2000. And this was then superseded by the Overgrowth Intellectual Disability or OGID study in 2019. The main reason for the rebranding was that we moved the study from the Institute of Cancer Research to St. George's University of London, which is where I'm based clinically. And so it made sense to have the research there as well. But also we had recruited many adults to the study and so calling the study the childhood overgrowth study seemed to misrepresent many of the study participants. The study is an international study with more than 2,000 individuals recruited and they've been recruited with suspected overgrowth intellectual disability syndromes or OGID syndromes which are defined as height and or head circumference at least two standard deviations above the mean. And that equates to about the 98th centile on the WHO growth charts. But also to be recruited to the study, children and adults needed to have an intellectual disability as well. And many had associated congenital medical problems. And the study has three main aims. The first aim is to identify new genetic mechanisms of the overgrowth intellectual disability syndromes. And then we aim to delineate the associated clinical features or phenotype associated with the new and established OGID syndromes. And finally, we translate those findings into diagnostic laboratories and into clinical practice for patient and family benefit. And over the last 20 years, we've been applying these study goals to a number of different overgrowth intellectual disability syndromes. Initially, we studied the SOTO syndrome, where we recruited 266 individuals with alterations in the NSD1 gene. And we defined the molecular basis to SOTO syndrome, the associated clinical problems and investigated genotype phenotype correlate correlations. Next, in 2011, we identified EZH2 as the cause of Weaver syndrome, which is another OGID syndrome. And we subsequently delineated the clinical and learning problems associated with this condition. In 2014, we identified DNMT3A as a cause of an OGID syndrome, and we further defined the clinical presentation of TBRS in 2018. And then we identified another overgrowth gene called HIST1H1E in 2015, before clarifying the phenotype of HIST1H1E and two other genes, CHD8 and BRWD3 in 2019. And in all instances, we have proposed management guidelines based upon our study findings to promote consistency in practice across the world. But today I'm going to think about DNMT3A and TBRS and outline our particular journey to identifying this new OGID gene and the work we have done and are doing to clarify the associated clinical presentation. Our journey to identifying DNMT3A as a cause of OGID started with two individuals recruited to our study with very similar overgrowth phenotypes and more specifically similar facial appearance that were not consistent with other previously described OGID syndromes. Given that most OGID syndromes are sporadic and caused by dominant mutations, we hypothesized that a de novo heterozygous variant was most likely to be causing this new phenotype and we employed TRIO whole exome sequencing and filtered for de novo variants targeting the same gene. And we got lucky, we identified de novo DMMT3A variants in both individuals. We then extended our analyses using Sanger sequencing to investigate 456 individuals recruited to our study. And we identified an additional 11 individuals with DMMT3A variants, bringing our total of, of individuals with the DNMT3A variants to 13 and we published these findings in Nature Genetics in 2014. 
And then over the next four years, we identified 42 more individuals with DMMT3A variants, some of whom were identified within our study, and some were recruited where DMMT3A variant had been identified in the diagnostic laboratories. And so this brought our total number of patients with a DMMT3A variant to 55 and allowed us to define the molecular landscape and phenotypic features of TBRS. This cartoon shows the DNMT3A protein and then the range of different DNMT3A variants that we identified. You'll see that the predominant variant type are the missense variants, and these are shown as yellow lollipops above the protein. And we identified 30 different missense variants in 36 individuals. And you'll see that the hotspot mutations, particularly at residue arginine 749 and at arginine 882. In frame deletions, we've identified in two individuals, and these are represented by the blue lollipops, again above the protein. And then frame shift and nonsense variants are shown below the protein, and these are represented by red lollipops for the frame shift variants and black lollipops for the nonsense or stop gain variants. So having defined the molecular landscape, we then went on to look at the phenotype or the clinical presentation of the 55 individuals. And we're able to show that most individuals had this cardinal clinical triad of overgrowth, intellectual disability and facial gestalt. And we're now going to consider each of these in turn. So we asked the clinicians who had referred the participants to the study to say whether their patient had an intellectual disability or not, and if they did, to classify that intellectual disability as mild, moderate or severe. And all of the individuals in our study had some degree of intellectual disability. But you'll see here on the graph on the right that the majority, about 65%, had a moderate intellectual disability. There was also some anecdotal evidence, and we don't have the numbers yet, but that a minority of teenagers might lose some of their neurodevelopmental skills. Um, it's currently unclear the proportion of teenagers who suffer this regression and whether there are precipitating factors, but we're trying, currently trying to work to understand this. We then looked at growth. And 83% of individuals in our study met our criteria for overgrowth with height and or head circumference, at least two standard deviations above the mean. And the graphs on the right show the growth parameters for those 55 individuals in the clinical study. The top graph shows the height, the middle, the head circumference, and the bottom graph is the weight in standard deviations above their respective ages. And you'll see that this orange line here represents two standard deviations above the mean. So we would consider an individual to have a significantly increased height, head circumference or weight if they plotted above this orange line. In addition, if you look at the bottom chart there of the weight, you'll see that there is an upward trajectory of the weight as the child progresses from childhood into teenage years and then into adults. And indeed, this weight is, is one of the key problems in TBRS, and we don't yet know what the cause of it is, and it's likely to be a combination of factors, including hypothalamic dysfunction, a lack of satiety, and also food-seeking behaviour, which is easier to control in young children than in teenagers. The final clinical feature of the TBRS triad is the facial gestalt, and this is most evident from early to teenage years. Before then, and you'll see that from the slide, it can be very, very difficult to clinically diagnose TBRS. But from teenage years, when the facial appearance naturally becomes heavier, you'll see that uh, teenagers have heavy horizontal eyebrows, they have narrow palpable fissures, and they can have prominent central incisors. We looked at the associated clinical problems, and this table here shows uh, clinical problems that were reported in more than 20%, but fewer than 80% of individuals. And this is by no means an exhaustive list, and as time goes on, we're realising that there are more and more TBRS clinical associations. 
but joint hypermobility is the most common and was reported in nearly three quarters of our study participants. Just over half of study participants had hypertonia, which was most frequent in the neonatal period and often got better as a child became older. Again, in just more than 50%, there were behavioural and neuropsychiatric issues reported, and these included autistic spectrum disorder, the neurodevelopmental regression that I, I um, touched upon earlier, anxiety disorder, and then some individuals had psychosis. And then finally, a third of individuals had kyphoscoliosis, and just over 20% had afebrile seizures. So what is DNMT3A? What does it do? So DNMT3A stands for DNA methyl transferase 3A, and it is one of a family of four DNA methyl transferases. So as part of that family, there are also DNMT3B, DNMT1, and DNMT3L. And DNMT3A preferentially methylates cytosine bases, converting them to 5-methyl cytosine. And DNMT3A is particularly important for de novo methylation. So that is in the establishment of new methylation marks following the erasure of the parental methylation during early embryonic development, but also in the establishment of sex-dependent methylation marks of imprinted genes during gametogenesis. And current evidence suggests that the DNMT3A variants that cause overgrowth do so because of reduction in DNMT3A protein activity. And DNMT3A is one of the key genes involved in age-related clonal hepatopoiesis. So age-related clonal hematopoiesis describes an expansion of cells that harbour an initiating driving mutation. And in studies to investigate clonal hematopoiesis and the incidence of mutations in hematological driver genes at different ages, DNMT3A is the most common mutation gene, as is shown in the pie charts on the right in this diagram here. And you'll see that those pie charts are taken from three independent studies, two in 2014 and the third in 2017. And DNMT3 in these pie charts is represented by the blue shaded wedge. And on the left, you'll see a graph that shows the percentage of individuals with clonal hematopoiesis at different ages. And you'll see from this graph that actually clonal hematopoiesis is really very rare below the age of 40, but at older ages, the increases rapidly. And this has two important implications for patients with a DNMT3A variant detected in lymphocyte-derived DNA. The first is that if that patient is older than the age of 40, then that, to that variant that you're identifying in the lymphocyte-derived DNA may not be constitutional, but may be due to this clonal hematopoiesis. So it's really important to test a second tissue type, such as fibroblast-derived DNA. And the second important implication is, actually, if you look at uh, older iterations of the NOMAD data, they were absolutely littered with DNMTAs, uh, DNMT3A variants, including premature truncating variants. And this is a result of the fact that the NOMAD data has many older patients in it, and also includes data from studies such as the TCGA. And that has meant that it's been very difficult to use the NOMAD data in order to interpret DNMT3A variants. And I just, I mentioned this to clinical colleagues when they, they have a new patient, they identify a new patient with TBRS and a DNMT3A variant. So it's really important to understand about this background rate. I'm not going to spend much time today thinking about DNMT3A and cancer because I know that Tim Lee will be talking extensively about this topic later in the conference. Suffice it to say that DNMT3 was known in the somatic cancer world long before it was known in the constitutional neurodevelopmental world as a drive mutation in hematological cancers, particularly AML. And indeed, as you'll see here in this graph from COSMIC, 
there's a hotspot driver variant, arginine 882, and that's found in many of the haematologic cancers, particularly AML. And initially, we thought we weren't going to see that particular variant constitutionally, but we now know that arginine 882 is also one of the most common um, DNMT3A residues to be infected, affected in TBRS as well. And what we currently don't know is the incidence of cancers, particularly AML, in TBRS. And we're currently working to try to clarify what this incidence is. Until we know that, in the UK, we advise patients and families to keep a close eye on any um, possible AML-related symptoms and to have quite a low threshold for in investigation of any of these. And then I also wanted to mention that all, not all variants within DNMT3A are associated with increased growth. There's now increasing evidence that specific DNMT3A variants are associated with gain of function and that these are associated with growth retardation and microcephaly. And you'll see from this diagram here that these variants clustered to a region in the PWWP domain. And understanding these variants and why they cause the opposite phenotype to TBRS is really important because this can afford us important insights into the processes whereby the TBRS variants cause overgrowth, which will have implications down the line for management and therapeutics. So although we've made really good progress in our understanding of this new OGID syndrome, there are still many unknowns. At the molecular level, we still don't know really about why the different DNMT3A variants cause OGID. We know there is a broad range of clinical presentations of TBRS, but we don't know why that is. What causes this range in, in the severity of the TBRS um, phenotype? And as technologies improve, and our understanding of DNMT3A gets better, it'll be important to try to decipher the factors that determine that symptom severity. Finally, in order to provide families with accurate information about TBRS and to keep patients safe, it is essential that we understand the full TBRS phenotypic spectrum and whether there are any new or progressive problems associated with TBRS. Which leads us on to the next steps. Many groups are working on DNMT3A to learn more about how it causes TBRS, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing their talks later on in the conference. There's also real hope that we will be able to learn more about the TBRS phenotype, including long term complications through the establishment of a TBRS registry that Jill has worked incredibly hard on and will be launching imminently. Finally, both an improving knowledge of how DNMT3A works and the phenotype of TBRS will aid in the development of therapeutics, which all together will promote optimal and consistent patient management worldwide. So on that note, I'd like to extend a big thank you to Jill and the organising committee for arranging this CRN conference. I'm very much looking forward to hearing the rest of this morning and tomorrow, and hope through discussion and the sharing of ideas, we can all learn, develop research, and push forward towards the ultimate goal of optimal patient management. Thank you.